Hello everyone and welcome back to the series of evolution of computers. Today we are in the part 2. So without any further ado, let's get to learning. Coming to the topics that we are going to cover in this session. From the evolution of computers, today we will cover the first generation and the second generation. Let's now begin with the first generation. Now before diving straight to the first generation of computers, Let's have a small recap of the mechanical era. Now, in the previous session, we learned that the mechanical era of computation existed from 1623 till the early 1940s. During 1623, Wilhelm Schickard's calculating clock was invented. And the German scientist and mathematician Wilhelm Schickard invented the calculating clock so that it could assist him in his astronomical and mathematical calculations. However, it was destroyed in a fire in 1624. The existence of Chicard's work was rediscovered in the 20th century when the letters which he exchanged with Johannes Kepler were found. Today, historians consider the calculating clock as the pioneer in the field of mechanical computation. Thereafter, the next big milestone of mechanical era of computation was at 1642 when Blaise Pascal invented his Pascaline to assist his father who was a tax collector with the tedious task of performing numerical calculations. The Pascaline could perform addition and subtraction. It also operated in decimal number system. Notice the image. You can see these wheels, right? And each of these wheels could represent any digit from 0 to 9. However, the limitation of Pascaline was that it couldn't handle complex calculations like carrying over multiple digits. Now, during 1671, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz's step recorder provided the aid in complex calculations. It could perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Additionally, it used a stepped drum mechanism to perform those operations with each step representing a digit. This device, using repeated addition and subtraction, could perform multiplication and division, respectively. Now, after 1671, the golden age of mechanical era was considered the decade of 1820s till 1830s. During this time period, Charles Babbage invented his difference engine. It consisted series of interconnected gears, levers, and axles, which were used to calculate polynomial functions such as logarithmic and trigonometric tables by computing the finite differences between successive values. Later, Charles Babbage, as an advancement of the difference engine, proposed the analytical engine, which was considered to be the first generation of general purpose computer. And we also know during 1843, Lady Ada Lovelace wrote the first algorithm for the analytical engine. Now, I mentioned earlier that the mechanical era spanned from 1623 till early 1940s. So, the question is, what happened from 1843 till the early 1940s? Well, the period from 1843 to early 1940s didn't witness the widespread practical implementation of computing devices due to limited technological infrastructure, lack of standardized components, and specifically due to the absence of clear understanding of how to build general purpose computers. Remember, analytical engine was never completed. However, some of the notable contributions during that period were Hermann Hollerith's tabulating machine, which was used to process and analyze data for the United States Census. Later, his company became a part of the company we know today as IBM. Also during that period, the punt card technology was invented. And the most notable contribution was Alan Turing's paper on computable numbers which introduced the concept of a theoretical computing machine known as Turing machine, which laid the theoretical foundation for the concept of a general purpose computer. So that was the revision of the mechanical era. Let's now get into the first generation of computation. 
Now the first generation of computers used something called the vacuum tubes. And these vacuum tubes dominated the decade of 1940s till 1950s. Now if we talk about the structure of the vacuum tubes, at one end we have got the cathode and the other end is the anode. And these contacts are insulated from one another by the vacuum inside the tube. Thus the name vacuum tube. Now in the first generation of computers, vacuum tubes were used as the single pole switch. Now coming to single pole switch, it is a basic electrical switch used to control a light or device from a single location. It has two terminals, the cathode and the anode, and allows us to either connect or disconnect the circuit by flipping the switch. Remember, it works as a switch. Now the working principle of the vacuum tubes can be better illustrated if we attach a circuit to it. Since it is cathode, we need to connect the negative end of the power supply to this and the positive end through the circuit will be connected to the anode. Now in order to activate this switch, the connection of power supply is important. The negative end of the battery which is connected to the cathode will heat up the cathode and after the cathode is heated for a time duration, flow of electrons from the cathode to the anode will activate the switch thus activating the circuit. Try to understand this as electrons are emitted from the surface of the heated cathode being negatively charged, they fly at tremendous speed to the anode. Now the question is, if it is just a switch, why it was hailed in the engineering era of 1940s till 1950s? And the reason is due to six factors. The vacuum tubes could work as six different components. At first, it could work as a rectifier, which helps the conversion of alternating current to pulsating direct current, which has quite a few applications. During long range communication, vacuum tubes can also work as amplifiers. It can also work as a generator and specifically due to this property, during 1920s, the KDKA radio station performed the world's very first entertainment broadcast. Also, the vacuum tubes can control the flow of electricity within the circuits. Apart from this, it can transform light into electric current. And for that, instead of the cathode, a photosensitive material is needed. And similarly, it can also transform electric current into light. And the specific example of that is the cathode ray tube. Due to all these factors, vacuum tubes were used in the first generation of computers. Now let me show you how using vacuum tubes, the logic gates were implemented. As you can see on the screen, this is the circuit of AND, this is the circuit of OR, and this one is the vacuum tube made circuit of naught. Well, I'm not going to explain the details of these circuits because the vacuum tubes are obsolete. However, let me point out the vacuum tubes in the circuits. In the circuit of AND, you can see these are the vacuum tubes. And in OR, these two are the vacuum tubes. Also, in case of naught, these two are the vacuum tubes. Let me tell you. The portion which is connected to the ground is actually the cathode and the portion above it which is looking like an inverted T is the anode. Notice basic AND, OR and NOT are implemented using complex circuits. Let's now talk about the milestones of the first generation. In 1942, the Atenasov Berry computer or ABC was invented. The mathematics and physics professor John Vincent Atenasov, with the assistance from one of his grad students, Clifford Berry, designed and successfully tested ABC, that is the Atenasov Berry computer, which was designed to solve systems of linear equations at Iowa State University in 1942. Later, due to World War II assignments, Professor Atenasov had to leave Iowa State University and therefore the work on the machine was discontinued. Although it was impactful, it pioneered 
important elements of modern day computing like binary arithmetic and electronic switching. Now its CPU had more than 300 vacuum tubes which achieved the frequency of 60 Hertz. Interestingly, only one unit of this computer was sold. Then in 1943, Colossus was developed in England by British code breakers to help the crypt analysis of the Lorentz cipher during World War II. It used vacuum tubes to perform Boolean and counting operations. And Colossus is still regarded as the world's first programmable electronic computer, though it didn't have the stored program concept or capability. It was programmed manually by switches and plugs. Thereafter, taking the inspiration from John Vincent Atenasov, and financed by the United States Army secretly the development of ENIAC or the Electrical Numerical Integrator and Computer began at University of Pennsylvania's Moore School of Engineering in 1943 under the codename Project PX. In 1946, after the World War II, its existence was made public. Thereafter, in 1951, the UNIVAC-1 mainframe computer became famous for predicting the outcome of the US presidential election in the following year. So these were the milestones of the first generation of computers which used vacuum tubes. So that was all about the first generation of computers. Let's learn about the second generation of computers. Now, during the second generation of computers, the advent of transistors replaced the previously used vacuum tubes. And what were the reasons for this replacement? Well, the transistors were smaller in size. And this miniaturization allows for the creation of compact and portable electronic devices, which is crucial for modern day applications like smartphones and laptops. Thereafter, the transistors were more energy efficient. In the first generation of computers, the usage of vacuum tubes resulted in excessive heat. And since the transistors were more energy efficient, that is, they generated less heat during operation, contributing to energy savings and enabling the design of the more power efficient electronic systems. Additionally, transistors are highly reliable. Vacuum tubes were more prone to failure and their filaments could burn out, reducing the overall system reliability. Coming to transistors, these have greater durability than vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes being glass enclosed were more fragile and could be damaged easily. Also, the transistors consumed lesser power. And this property is especially important in battery-powered devices and energy-conscious applications. Furthermore, in case of vacuum tubes, the contacts, that is the anode and cathode, are isolated from one another using the vacuum. However, transistors are solid state in nature. That means, they have no moving parts. On the other hand, vacuum tubes relied on the movement of electrons within the vacuum which can introduce wear and tear over time. Moreover, the transistors have faster response time. This attribute is crucial for the applications where high-speed switching is necessary, such as in microprocessors and digital circuits. Also, the transistors are capable of operating at a higher frequency than the vacuum tubes. And this property makes the transistor suitable for applications in modern telecommunications, high-frequency radio and microwave systems. And finally, transistors are cost-effective. Mass production of transistors had led to the significant reduction in manufacturing costs over the time. So due to these reasons, transistors replaced vacuum tubes. Now let me show you how the basic gates can be implemented using transistors. Notice, 
these are the AND, OR and NOT circuits using transistor switches. And from the images themselves, you can notice one thing, the circuits are quite simpler than that of the vacuum tube circuits. Also observe, in AND and OR, we are using two transistor switches, whereas in case of NOT, only one transistor switch is being used. Also, the circuits are really simple. Let's now talk about the various milestones of the second generation of computers. Now, in the evolution of computers, we mark the second generation spanning from 1950s till early 1960s. In 1956, IBM introduced its 305 RAMAC or RAMAC, where RAMAC stands for Random Access Method of Accessing and Control. And it was the very first computer to ever use a hard disk drive for data storage. Now, the disk storage unit or the hard disk drive had the storage capacity of just 5 megabytes, although it consisted 50 24 inch platters. Additionally, due to random access, it had the ability to access any piece of data on the disk directly without having to sequentially read through the entire storage medium. This was a major improvement over earlier storage technologies that required sequential access. It also featured a punch card reader to which, using punch cards, inputs used to be provided. Later, during 1959, COBOL, that is Common Business Oriented Language, and Fortran, that is formula translation, these two programming languages were developed. So, these two are the most important milestones of the second generation of computers. So, in this session, we covered the topics first generation and the second generation in the evolution of computers. All right, people, that will be all for this session. In the next session, we are going to cover the last two generations, that is the third and the fourth generation of computers. So, I hope to see you in the next one. Thank you all for watching.